the culture, as I think about the history of the company in the hundred years and in my experience over almost 40 years, I attribute it to uh, Lyon Bradley, who died in 1942, who was a great humanitarian, loved the people, wanted the feeling of a family, wanted people to want to work here, wanted to attract the best and to retain the best as employees. And then Harry came along as his partner, and Harry believed in the culture and uh, wanted the people to have a good place to work and to stay for long periods of time with this company. And then Fred Luck carried that right on through. He was a great believer in the orchestra and chorus. And so the culture of Alan Bradley is very attributable to these two brothers and to Fred Luck, the draftsman that they hired uh, back in the early years. When I interviewed with the company in 1963, I had already had a number of interviews with other companies, all public companies, all engineering-oriented technology companies. And I interviewed at Allen Bradley because of some family connections. And I was most impressed. First of all, it was a private company. Secondly, the executives that I met during the tour were sitting right out with the people doing all of the sales work, all of the order processing work. Uh, the feeling that it was family and different from public companies is what attracted me. Well, I, uh, I grew up in Louisiana and I went to school at Texas A&M and I joined Allen Bradley in January 1963. And um, well, you know there's a big difference in weather between Milwaukee and, uh, and North Louisiana. So I left home and I had a, uh, uh, one of these uh, uh, just plain uh, overcoat, uh, London Fog is the name I was trying to think of. And um, got up here, it was, it was 65 at home, got up here, it was 19 below zero. I thought I would just die. And of course we had to go to work at about 6.15, 6.30 in the morning in those days as a trainee. And uh, it never got above zero that whole month. And walking from uh, what today is the Tega building to the plant, which is we had to park at the Tega building, I'll never forget it. I almost quit. It was, it must have, windshield factor must have been 50 below zero. I mean, it was just unbelievable. But I hung in there, and I'm glad I did. The first 40 years I was in radio sales and electronic sales. And um, when the company decided to put the entire electronics division at the facility in El Paso, Texas, I couldn't make the move. I had an 89-year-old mother at home that wouldn't go, so I stayed. And then I was transferred to the library. Now, after 40 years, I had a new job. And I learned library technology. So that opened up a lot of doors. And I knew, I knew electronics backwards and forwards. I knew every part number that ever existed. And even the changes within the department were good for me because I love changes. I really and truly do. But 40 years later, I go into a filing department. Now I'm starting all over again <laughs> and learning all the library technology versus the electronics technology. Tiny Raider is, is certainly a, a very big influence in, in a lot of people's careers. And when you got assigned, uh, when you'd fin spent your 15 or 16 months here, you couldn't leave the company without Tiny talking to you. And it, it was pretty impressive for a you know, person out of college, a little over a year, to walk up to the president of the company and he'd yell out at his secretary to hold his calls. And he'd spend 45 minutes or so just talking to you, trying to get to know you. And to a certain extent, you knew that you didn't go out the door without his stamp of approval. And uh, he told some stories of when he was a sales guy and uh, he, he kind of uh, sent you out with a little bit of fire in your belly of, you know, hey, you are the company when you're out there. You're the person that, that they think the company is. Make sure you, you represent the company well. We got most of our help from recommendations of employees. But Lynn and Harry Bradley had a, a dogma that they would not have a woman, the wife of a worker, did not have to work. She should be home and all that. And this is a, 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 a way they look at it, and which I totally agreed, okay? Uh, so when my brother-in-law died, 
they immediately hired my sister because she had to replace her husband now as an income for the family. And that's the way they looked at, at, at the family. The family had to, to them, the family was, a woman took care of the children and took care of the house and all that. And, and her. When he passed away, they made damn sure that there's going to be an income coming in for him. They did an awful lot during that depression to keep people here and because they couldn't give them raises. Yeah. And uh, that was when they started the incentive, uh, ship, ship, shipping incentive, was it? Yeah, some kind of an incentive because when I first started here, there were people still getting that from that time. And one of the women I worked with in cost accounting was retiring with them. A nice little nest egg. <laughs> we ended up in our heyday, which was during the war years. We had 100 molders that would make about uh, oh, uh, 80 to 90 thousand a shift, and we worked three shifts. It never was. We worked around the clock constantly. The only day off we had was Sunday, and uh, during the war years, we even worked Sunday. The products that we were selling. We knew that they were part of the war effort, but that was, we had priority orders and uh, we knew what had to go out when, what orders were more important than others, but we were never told. That was like, that was very confidential type information. We never knew where anything was going. Most of uh, the managers they had here at that time uh, is the ones that enforced quality. I remember when I started out here and I got transferred not transferred, I had proved myself uh, and I moved off of making little tiny contacts and started working building cabinets itself and the uh, boss would constantly, if he heard my files squeaking on metal, he'd quickly come up and show me I was doing it wrong and, and that I had better change my ways because <laughs> they wanted only the best and they had to do it right. We dressed in those years, in spite of the fact that they were war years, we had to wear nylons, we had to wear, we, we wore heels, we wore nylon stockings, we wore skirts, we wore business suits. We dressed a lot more formal than today's casual theme. White shirt and ties is what, what you saw and, and everybody sat around the conference room table and uh, when the boss said, and we're going to do it this way, they all went, yes. <laughs> the end of the 40s, the veterans were coming home the ladies who were working out in the shop, they went back home and some were married, some were getting married as the men were coming back, but they went home to be wives and mothers and the men came back to their jobs. And that's when the company started with a lot of the social activities here. We had a baseball team, we had a basketball team, we had bowling teams, and we had, of course, Tony Worth and the orchestra and chorus, and we had a dramatic club. It was great. The people were friendly. They had so many outside activities that you could engage in after work. Uh, that's from any, everything from photography to rifle clubs to bowling. To, uh, you had such a variety of, of uh, sport events that you could join. You even had card games uh, that you could play and so I thought it was unique, and I, and I thought it was a great to start working here. I remember going to the Christmas parties very vividly, and I remember in turn bringing our children to the Christmas parties, and it was always something that, that we looked forward to as a family, especially with my children and my wife, and bringing our, our kids, and, and it was, a, it was a, really the, the roots again of the company, where they got together not just as employees, and had parties for their employees, but also brought the family together. And I think, again, that's just the feeling that the Bradleys brought into the organization and really fostered over the years. Bradleys, at that time, was always interested in our welfare, you know. They had all these different organizations. They had these 10-year parties uh, and 25-year parties when you reached the age of 25 years here. Uh, they also had, as I said, this unique medical program here that. Uh, because they felt a well person, uh, if you keep them well, they'll get better work out of them and they won't have so much absentee. And, and I really think it worked, you know. And they also, uh, was also unique that many of them could, you know, get their, you know, brothers or sisters hired 
order of children hired here, that it was kind of nice. You can't do that today anymore. During World War II, Alan Bradley had a USO group. And um, I must have passed the test and didn't even know what it was, but I was one of the gals that was left in. And we, we would, um, we were told when we had to be downtown and what time the, the sailors would be coming in, what time they had to go back. They would, um, we went, we came, we brought them to the plant. We brought them to different veterans posts. We ate, we talked, we danced. Working at Alla Bradley was a pleasure. It was terrific. That building, I doubt if there's another factory in the world where the men's rooms and the ladies' room were in marble. The stalls were marble from Italy and Vermont, where they have a cafeteria with tiles on the wall, which you're very familiar with, I'm sure. It came from Europe. I mean, there was something about that building so comfortable. Not only did they give breaks, but in the years ago, when I first started, they had a man from the cafeteria come down with a cart, you know, to give us donuts, or we could buy don fresh donuts and fresh bakery, which they made upstairs. I think the one thing that stands out, and it, it still stands out to employees, new employees, as we bring them in today, is the focus that the Bradley brothers had on the employees that worked for them. Whether, whether you see it in the management style that we have today, it's been something that's, it's been part of our cultural thread throughout the years. Uh, it, it was just something they focused on. Whether it was a, a gym in a facility, whether it was uh, having a, a very complete cafeteria, whatever it was, they were always looking at ways to try to focus on the employee. We were a family. I know it sounds corny sometimes to say things like that, but we actually were. We looked out for each other, and we didn't, we didn't compete against each other all the time. We weren't always elbowing each other aside to get to the top or whatever it was. You know, we had that feeling. I've never felt I've worked for, for one company here. Um, and because this company has changed dramatically over the, over the time that I've been here. And I've always had the opportunity to do different things, um, to be part of change uh, throughout the history uh, that I've been here. And like I said, it's never seemed like I've felt like I've worked for the same company. And so I would say I, I have worked for different companies. It just so happens that, that it's, uh, it's always been part of uh, Allen Bradley and Rockwell Automation. We did things in the sales division probably very differently than they did today. For example, in the uh, sales arena, one of the ways that I learned how to sell uh, was that I was loaded with a car, uh, given a car, loaded with product, told to go into Iowa and, and to sell pressure switches. No expense accounts, uh, no reimbursement or anything, and I couldn't come back until everything in the car was sold. Well, it was great to be at Allen Bradley, primarily because there was stress throughout. We didn't worry about paperwork or anything else, because if you had a problem today, uh, I'd help you out because you'd help me out tomorrow. So that camaraderie was first rate. Uh, and I think that is what's, what made Allen Bradley great. My goal when I, when I started to work here was to someday make $25,000 a year. And, uh, and I thought uh, if I could ever become vice president of sales, that would be a really big deal. And uh, as, as time went by and uh, I, you know, had the opportunity to run some businesses and, and I, I think I did them successfully and uh, it did dawn on me that maybe I had a chance to become president of, of the company. One of the things that would happen is Fred Look kind of set the stage so that when he bought a car, he always bought an American-built car, but when, once Fred bought the car, then everybody else underneath would buy the next lower one down. So Fred bought at that particular year an Oldsmobile 98, and the Oldsmobile 98 uh, set the pattern for everybody else. So the, rest of the executives around the company were uh, streaming into the various uh, places and they elected to get cars. Turns out that uh, Les Watson got a Pontiac Catalina. 
the same time that Les Watson, who was making a lot of money at that time, bought a Pontiac Catalina, one of the trainees that was on the sales training program also bought a car, a Pontiac Bonneville convertible, fully equipped with everything in it. And Bill Younger caught on that a trainee had bought this car, which was elevated above the Watson car. So at that point in time, he went in Fred Luck. Fred Luck pulled in Les Watson with, uh, with Bill Younger and asked him for a description of his car. And Les Watson proceeded to talk about how this car was, uh, Pontiac Catalina was really, really nice and all that kind of stuff. He went through this long process. And finally, Fred said, well, could you talk to trainee Edwards, that's me, <laughs> and would you bring him in and ask him about his car? So I got pulled from the bowels of the organization someplace and uh, walked in there. And, and Les Watson said, I understand you got a new car. Tell me about your car. So I went, it was a Pontiac, it was a Bonneville, it was a convertible, and it had the big engine, you know, special paint jobs, all thing. And Watson was just fuming over this thing. And of course, uh, Fred Look was in the corner laughing, and, and Bill Younger was laughing. Well, you'd think that this would end at this point, but it didn't. The next thing that happened very shortly after he got the car, uh, it turns out that uh, Fred or, or Les Watson came in, drove into the parking lot, and at that time, this is another uh, thing that I, I have as a legacy, uh, the garage door opener didn't have a sensor to tell when the garage door was all the way down. So what happened is Les moved his car in, his new car, and as he came in, the garage door came down and went ka-chunk, 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 all over this new car. The guy that was in charge of the security got on the phone immediately to get everybody to scatter. He disappeared. Frank Keller disappeared. They got in touch with me and said, you don't want to see Les Watson at this point in time. And from that, we finally had uh, uh, actually sensors on the garage doors to make sure that from here on in, when an executive came in to the, uh, uh, into the parking lot, that if it came down, it would go back up. During one of the strikes that we had here, I was transferred out in, into the resistor shipping area. I was actually packing and shipping resistors. And uh, I complained about, they had, well, they had to teach me how to pack quantities of resistors in which particular carton. There's a real, there's a, it's a program. If you have a thousand, it goes in such and such a box. If it's 10,000, it goes. And I complained about the fact that I had to get up on a ladder and I had to get these particular boxes and I had to actually seal them. And I was told by the gentleman who ran the shipping department during the strike, he said, Emily, when it's all over, I want you to come back. And he said, I want you to see the age of the women that do this work. And I went back and they were, quote, little old ladies and gave it their all. They would crawl up and down these ladders, and they, it was their job. Yes, there, there was dedication. There really truly was. They worked hard. They worked hard. They were the best years, and uh, it was the best place in Milwaukee to work. Well, to be honest with you, I enjoyed it. Uh, management at that time was very friendly. Everybody was in first names and so forth. And uh, if you were doing your job, you were practically left alone. I'm very proud of it. And uh, we missed a lot of the things that Alan Bradley stood for and uh, wish they would come back for the employees. They're, they don't know what they're missing. They're a very excellent employee-oriented company. Uh, they have provided extremely well, not only when I worked for them in challenging me professionally, uh, I was always excited about going to work every day. In the 70s, for Dimension 70, which was another sales uh, program that we had, the, uh, our, our electronics group decided to put a fifth color ban on the fixed resistor. And the fifth color band was designated as a yellow band. And I don't know if I was chosen or if I volunteered to be Miss Fix Resistor, but they put me in a resistor powder barrel, cut out 
a space on top for my head and for my arms. And at the end of each, they had all of the electronic salespeople in from all of the sales offices. And at the end of every class, I had to put that barrel on and hand each of the field salesmen a yellow garter representing the yellow color band. That was another highlight of my career at Allen Bradley. <laughs> what I was looking for and uh, the ability to work for a successful company and one that was dynamic and that uh, created opportunities and challenges and to be challenged. I mean, at the end of the day, that's, uh, that's, that's what people, people want to have. I mean, they want to be challenged and they want to contribute. And uh, that's, that's so important. And if you can find that in one company, great. And I've been able to do that. And I've been very fortunate to, uh, to be able to have, that, uh, have those experiences and, and be able to uh, uh, continue to be working uh, at the same company I started with. You know, today it's, uh, it's kind of unusual when you stand up and talk to people and tell them you're a lifer, which means you work for the same company for 40 years. But um, it was a company I was very proud to work for for 40 years. So I loved it, and I retired with regret. I worked four extra years. I was 69 before I retired. But I have a lot of great memories. I really do. And when I come to something like the retiree luncheon and I see all the guys I used to work for, I get that family feeling again, you know? And when we hear some sad news about some of them, it's like your uncle or your aunt, you know? Bottom line is uh, we had a great time. We had a lot of fun. Uh, there were great people in the organization. And uh, it was just a, a time of a very entrepreneurial company that uh, pushed decision making down. And when I look back in time, it's by far the, the finest company that I've ever seen. So.